I am excited, and I'm glad you're excited tonight. It's, an, it's a privilege to be able to share the Word of God. It's also a privilege to be able to serve with an amazing worship team, and it's fun to get to play difficult songs. <laughs> Especially when you don't play a whole lot. Tonight, we're going to continue on in our series, Encountering God. As you know, Pastor Chad and Pastor Mike have been sharing messages, Pastor Wayne as well, throughout the last few weeks. Um, we've been talking about different encounters that different people in the Bible have had with God and, and the different impacts that, they've, that those encounters have had on them. And as I was preparing for this message, I was just kind of looking at a theme. And the theme that kind of stuck out to me at first was the word transformation. And so I, I titled this message Transformation. And I'm going to basically give you the, the end point right out the beginning. And then we can all go home, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> here's the point. The, the desired outcome of an encounter with God is transformation. That's, that's what we hope for. That's what we hope that when we encounter God, that we are transformed. We are different than before. You know, transformation is when something goes from one state to another. And we're going to look at that tonight a little bit, but we're actually going to look at something that happens in between. Now, one person that is an example of this, obviously, is the Apostle Paul. You know, he, he has this encounter with God on the road to Emmaus. He sees a bright light. He hears the Lord speak to him. And there's a transformation. Remember that this is a man that at that time in his life was what we probably could say consumed with rounding up believers imprisoning them, persecuting them. This, this was his life's passion. And this man, after this encounter, transforms to write words like this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That is an amazing transition. When you think of where he was to coming to this place where that Reality becomes a part of him, and he's preaching that message to the people in Corinth. Now, every one of us, every person who has an encounter with God, we've had a moment of decision that determined whether or not we would move with God and be transformed, or whether we stay where we are. And I, I'm kind of putting a picture word to this, a hinge, you know, like a hinge, like in a door, it holds. A hinge is, is a mechanical device that connects two things, the door frame, let's say, and a door. And it connects, and, and in that noun of, of hinge, um, it also can be a verb in English. It can be a verb, and we would say something like, that hinged on that decision. It, it depended on this moment. And I think the, there are moments that God brings us to that are hinge moments in our life. And it's, it's interesting because a hinge can change direction. It can move the door. It can, it can change direction. So something can be coming in this direction and be going out a different direction. And, and again, I believe these are moments that take place their hinge moments. Our future depends on our decision in that moment, in these hinge moments. So we're going to look at that tonight. And I want to continue on. Last week, Pastor Chad talked us through a little bit of the later life of the Apostle Peter and how the Lord intervened in his life and the life of Cornelius and orchestrated them coming together, which again was a hinge moment because it redirected the future of the faith, right? It was a decision. Peter was again faced with a decision, a hinge moment that he had to make a decision that would change the direction of the faith. So we're going to look tonight, we're going to back up. We're going to rewind. Now, how many people remember cassette tapes? Okay, I'm not alone. Rewind. Do you remember that? Rewind. Kids, you have no idea what I'm talking about. All right. Um, <laughs> rewind. We're going to look at a little bit earlier in the early life of Simon Peter. Okay? And if you're like me, when, when I was younger and I used to read 
the Word of God, there was a specific story that I just pictured this is the story of how the Lord called his first disciples, being Andrew, Peter, James, and John. This is how it happens. And this is, this is one of two similar accounts that are recorded both in the, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. And I, I want to read this to you tonight. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 18. I just want to read this to you. And this kind of sets us up for where we're going to go. So, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says this. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And when I used to read the story when I was younger, I was like, how in the world does that happen? I mean, okay, granted, it's Yeshua. He's the son of God. He's very charismatic. But he's standing on the seashore, and he said, hey, hey, you guys, follow me. And I'll make you fisher of men. They're like, sure, we ain't, we ain't doing nothing. Let's go. I'm like, how, how does that happen? Right? Anybody ever thought that? And again, these, these stories are, are it's almost identical between the Gospel of Mark and Matthew. So h- how does this come about? And I always used to wonder about that. But you all remember there used to be a thing called the rest of the story? You remember that? Uh, was it Paul Harvey that used to do the rest of the story? Paul Harvey was a radio personality. He did a thing called the rest. So tonight, we're going to stop and look a little bit at the rest of the story. So let's back up a little bit, and we're going to look at the Gospel of John, because John actually gives us some interesting information. Now, we're going to go to the Gospel of John. We're going to start in chapter 1, verse 28. And let me set this up before we read. John is the Apostle John, because I don't want to get confused, because we're going to talk about two Johns here. We have the disciple Apostle John, and then we have John the Baptist, okay? So the writer John, the Apostle, is, is sets this up, and he says John the Baptist is out in the Jordan area. He'll tell us here in a minute when we read, and he's, he's baptizing and he's preaching, and it says the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? You know, what are you doing here? You're a prophet. Who, who are you? So that's kind of where we're at when we pick up here in chapter 1, verse 28. Is he's the, John the Baptist is preaching. He's baptizing. People are coming to him from Jerusalem, priests and Levites, and they're asking him, who are you? And then John, in chapter, 20, in chapter 1, verse 28, says, All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is really, again, We got two Johns, and then actually we got two Bethanies. This is not the Bethany that we know of on the other side of the Mount of Olives, the home of Mary and Martha, the home of Lazarus. This is another Bethany out near the Jordan. A lot of people believe it was out just east of Jericho, okay, on that side. And so he gives us, first of all, a a locator. We know where something is happening. We know it was Bethany across the Jordan. This is where that's happening. And then he continues on in verse 29, and he says, The next day John saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, This is John the Baptist saw Yeshua coming toward him, and he, he said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So let's take timeline. We know where it's at. There was one day and then the next day. So we got two days. The next day, John the Baptist sees Yeshua. He said, Here's the Lamb of God. Then we jump down to verse 35. And it says again, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and when he saw Yeshua passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. So we have another time indicator, three days, before, the next day, and the next day. So we know this is at least three days. We don't know the area. It could have been around, but it couldn't have been more than a day's journey every day, right? So we know they're pretty much staying in the area. So again, the next day. And then it says this, the two disciples heard him say this, saying that, look, the Lamb of God, speaking of Yeshua, and followed Yeshua. And when Yeshua turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? 
He said, come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about 10 in the morning. And then it continues on in verse 40. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. So we know time, we know where, and we know that one of the two disciples was Andrew, Peter's brother. And we know pretty certainly that the other one was John, <laughs> okay? We know it was him. So both Andrew and, and John are there with John the Baptist. John the Baptist declares, Yeshua, this is the Son of God. They're intrigued by this, and they start to follow Yeshua. Now, there's a question here. What are these guys doing there? These are fishermen from Galilee. What are they doing out there? So I'm going to step aside here. I'm going to give you my, my theory or my belief. I believe this was a pilgrimage, pilgrimage festival time. I believe they were on a pilgrimage trip. As you know, Jewish men have to present themselves in the temple in Jerusalem so many times a year. And I believe this was a pilgrimage time. They had come up to Jerusalem, and they had stopped to see who's this guy that all these crowds are being drawn to, and what's going on? And they stick around, and they, they spend a few days around, and then they hear this guy say, there's the Lamb of God. And they go, what? And they, say, they start following him. And I think that's what brought them to this place at this time. And then it continues on in verse 40. It says, again, Andrew, Simon's, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John and followed him. And then it said, he first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means anointed one. And he brought Simon to Yeshua. Now, he didn't say he went back to Galilee and found his brother. So I, again, I think this lends to the idea that they were all on a pilgrimage festival together. Simon was around somewhere. He went and found him and said, hey, you got to see this guy. And he brings him to meet Yeshua. And then this happens. Listen to this. When Yeshua saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, Peter, which means the rock. And then it continues, the next day, he, Yeshua, decided to leave for Galilee. Now, imagine this is your first encounter with a person, and he says your name, and then he says, but I'm not going to call you that. I'm going to call you something else. I asked Pastor Chad if he had any good nicknames. But if you like, the first time I meet Pastor Chad, and I say, Pastor Chad Holland, I'm going to call you Hercules. <laughs> he likes that name. That's good. What? <laughs> I mean, really, in that context, okay, nice to meet you too. You know, what's happening here? Um, you know, he, at least how it's recorded here, he, he basically introduces himself by, by renaming Simon to Peter. And then it says again that he decided, Yeshua decided to leave for Galilee. Again, I think this again plays into my narrative. It was the end of the festival season. These guys were going home. Hey, I'll go with you. And he returned to Galilee with these fishermen. Okay? Now, we have to say that this, first, this is the first encounter of, of Simon Peter with Yeshua. It was unexpected. I, I don't think Simon Peter was like his brother, Andrew or, or John, that they were, they were kind of running around looking for something. He was like, well, what? What do, you, what do you want? What do you want? And they said, no, you got to come. And this was an unexpected encounter. And he gets this new name. And, and I, when I, as I thought about this, Lord, what, what, what was this about? And I believe Yeshua was making a statement from the very first moment he met Simon Peter. And he said, I know who you are. I know who you think you are. But walk with me because you can be somebody completely different. I have something for you that you don't even begin to imagine. And I'm going to tell you right now what that is. You're going to be the rock. And he sets the stage from the very first moment that Peter encounters him by, no, I know who you think you are. 
but let me tell you who you're going to be. Now, after that encounter, we, we don't see again really anything else until if we look at the Gospel of Luke. Let's look, let's look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 38 through 41. If we, we try to look at a timeline, this is really the next thing. It says this in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. After he, Yeshua, left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house, and Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. So he got up immediately and began, she got up immediately and began to serve them. So this is the next, I think in a chronological kind of thing, the next time we see Peter that we know of inter interacting. And it's, Yeshua is leaving the synagogue, he's teaching, you know, in Capernaum, Capernaum, he's, he's going over to the house, the mother's sick, he lays his hands on her, and then they fellowship, and then I think the story continues, and it says that people just began bringing all their sick and demon-possessed to, to him there, and, and he began to, to heal and to cast out demons, and he told the demons don't speak, because he, they were basically declaring he was the son of God, and he said, no, don't speak. He was forget, forbidding them to speak. But I believe during this time, Simon is watching. I believe he's watching. Who is this man? Who is this person that heals the sick, that does all of these things? And, and I believe this is just a period of time where he's Watching. And that brings us to our really our main text tonight. And that's going to be in Luke chapter 5. And this is where the story really gets deep and it gets thick. So let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and we're going to begin in verse 1. And here's what it says. Chapter 5 of Matthew verse 1. As the crowd was pressing in on Yeshua to hear God's word, he was standing by the lake in Nazareth and he saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked them to put out a little from land, and then he sat down and he was teaching the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to deep water and let's let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Yeshua's knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they took. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, and so were Simon's partners, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Yeshua told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Now that I get. You with me? I see now what was happening that caused them to walk away from what they knew. Now I just want to make a couple points here. It's interesting that it says in the beginning of this passage, Yeshua saw two boats. And it says later that John and James and their father Zebedee were business partners with Simon and Andrew. So these are two families, had two boats, and they worked together to, to, to catch fish. They were, they were partners. They worked together. And you all have heard, I'm sure, many messages where it says, you know, hey, the Lord's saying, you know, go out and put your nets down again. And, and Simon, you know, Simon again could have been like, look, I've fished all my life. I don't know that you've ever fished ever. <laughs> but we worked all night. What do you want? But, but there's something that happens here that his response is, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. And I think that's because, as we've seen, there was a relationship that had begun to develop between Yeshua and Simon Peter before this encounter. And I believe Yeshua is asking in this moment from, from Simon Peter for a little bit of faith. Trust me. Trust me. And Simon Peter says, okay, at your word, I'll trust you. 
This is the first real hinge moment in this story. He had a choice. He could have said, you're crazy. Bring the boats in. Get this guy off my boat. Let's all wash our nets and go home. Right? This was a hinge moment. It, it connected his past and his future. But he said, no, okay, Lord, I'll trust you. And with this miracle, Yeshua proves to Simon and the others uh, his faithfulness. Now, I want to just talk through the emotions that go through in this little sequence here because there's, it's an interesting process, I think, of emotions. I think in the beginning when, when Yeshua asks Peter, there's indifference. Like, okay, all right, your word, we'll, we'll go. And there's no expectation. It's okay, you know, we'll, we'll do what you ask. We'll go out. There's no, and why do I say that? Because they only took one boat out. They only took out one boat. So I think he really just said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll do this. So there's a little bit of indifference. Then they put down the nets, and the fish start to come in. And the indifference turns to excitement. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> what is happening? What is going on here? This is what's going on. And, and they're beginning to react in excitement. And I believe the excitement turns to anxiety as the nets begin to tear. Because if the nets tear, all of this is in vain. Because all of those fish will just return back to the sea. So there's all of a sudden anxiety. Oh, what are we, we going to do? And you see, his next thing is to call to the other boat. Get out here. We need help. So there's anxiety. Come on, come on, get out here. And then the anxiety, I think, shifts a little bit to fear. Because as they're bringing the fish into the boats, the boats are actually starting to sink. And there's a little bit of fear, like, we've got to get these boats into land. Or, or again, we're going to be out of a job because we're not going to have a boat anymore. So there's this process of emotions that takes place in this little interaction that, that leads through. And then at the end of this emotional roller coaster, Simon Peter falls at the knees of the Lord and says, leave me. Because I'm a sinful man. Now what I want you to catch is this isn't a well-crafted story. This was a moment in a man's life. Just like you and I will have moments like this in our life. Where you are brought through a roller coaster of emotions. And then all of a sudden you are faced with the reality of who you have been. And who you are. And Peter in that moment is faced with, I, I can't do this. He's brought to another hinge moment that will determine the connection between his past and his future. And he says, I, I can't do this, Lord. I am a sinful man. And at that moment, he's presented with a choice. And in our recent study that we did in discipleship, there was a chapter we did called Crisis of Faith. And let me read to you what it said in that chapter. Let me read this. The word crisis comes from a Greek word that means decision. The same word is often translated judgment. We aren't talking about calamity in your life such as an accident or death. This crisis is not a disaster or a bad thing. It is a turning point or a fork in the road that calls for a decision. You must decide what you believe about God, and how you respond when you reach this turning point will determine whether or not you proceed with God in something only he can do, or whether you continue on your own way and miss what God has purposed for your life. That's that moment. And his initial response is, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I'm a sinful man. I cannot go where you're asking me to go. And this crisis is where many people decide not to follow what they sense God is leading them to do. But what's amazing is look at the next phrase. This is what Yeshua says. Don't be afraid, Yeshua told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. In essence, Peter, Simon, I know who you were. I know who you are. 
But to me, it doesn't matter because I know who you're going to be. Trust me. Follow me. Walk with me. And in that moment, Peter makes a decision again that will redirect the rest of his life. And he leaves everything, it says in the next. In that moment, they left their boats, and they left everything, and they followed him. God invite, when God invites us to join him in his work, he presents a God-sized assignment he wants to accomplish. It will be obvious to us that we cannot do it on our own. If God doesn't help, we will fail. And that is the assurance that Yeshua gives here. Now, I have a personal story, I'm not going to share it right now, of a moment, and I'm sure we've all had moments like this in our life where we've come to that moment of crisis and that moment of decision, and it redirected our future. And these moments, are, they're not one-time experiences. Our lives seem to come to these hinge moments at different places. God walks, so this is not something that happens once. This, this happens at different stages in our life. God brings us to different places. And I want to kind of close this out with a story that happens after Yeshua has died. He's resurrected. And it's the third time that he appears to his disciples. And I want you to just listen to this. Um, it's in John chapter 21. And I want you to listen to the similarity to the story that we just read. This is John chapter 21. After this, Yeshua revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. Listen to this. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but, the night, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Yeshua stood on the shore. However, the disciples did not know it was Yeshua. Men, Yeshua called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? What a taunt. <laughs> No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Therefore, the disciple, the one Yeshua loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer garment around him, for he was stripped, and he plunged into the sea. But since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, and when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Yeshua told them. So Simon Peter got up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. It says here, 153 of them. And even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Yeshua told them. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Yeshua came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Yeshua appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had eaten breakfast, Yeshua said, asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. The second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Yeshua said. And he continued, I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to signify by what kind of death he would glorify God. Listen to this. After this, he told them, follow me. Do you see the similarity in these two accounts and the similarities that happen? And as I read this passage, I realized what had happened. After Yeshua was resurrected and he's appearing to them, where did they go? They went back to what they knew. They were going back to what they knew, to fishing. 
And remember, Yeshua said, from now on you will catch people. Why are you catching fish? I know who you were. I know what you were, but that's not where you're going. They had in a way gotten stuck. And Yeshua reminds Peter of who he was in reminding him of his denial. But then he says to him, as he said before, follow me. I have something greater. And this was that next hinge moment for this disciple. Okay, I'm not just going to default back to what I know, Lord. I'm going to go out and we're going to carry this message in, and we're going to fish for people. And you see another hinge moment here in the life of Peter. And I, I just thought this story and this account was so real, I think, for all of us in the sense of the story of our lives and the things that we've experienced, how God calls us and we're hesitant. But then he says, don't be afraid. So we take a step of faith and we, we go and then we start to head back towards what's, what we know and, and Yeshua comes back and re-engages us in that moment of decision again and says, no, listen, who I've called you to be is this, follow me. I'm going to close with what I started with. Our desire when we encounter the Lord should be transformation, right? It should be that we desire to be transformed Every person who has had an encounter with God has faced these kinds of hinge moments, that moment of decision, and it determined whether or not they would move with God and be transformed, or whether they would stay where they are. When God invites you to be involved in his activity, he wants to reveal himself to you into a watching world. Therefore, he will give you a God-sized assignment. When you are confronted with such a task, you'll face a crisis of belief. You'll have to decide what you really believe about the God who called you. And the way you respond to God will reveal what you believe, regardless of what you say. Let me read that again. How you respond to God will reveal what you believe, regardless of what you say. So I want to ask two questions in closing tonight. Are you presently experiencing a hinge moment where God has brought you to this decision-making time or a, a, a crisis where, God, I, I just don't know if I can do this. Is, is this a place? And again, I think this is not a place where it's like something to be ashamed of. This is part of our walk, part of our faith. So we will have these different encounters and these different interactions at different points in our life. And um, are you there? Is that a place that's real for you right now? And if so, what is God asking you to do? And as you go home this week and, and you ponder this, ask yourself, is there something that's keeping me from obeying him? Is it my past? Is it my insecurities? Is it my fears? What is it that's causing me to say, depart Move away from me, Lord. I can't, I can't do what you're asking. What is that? And if so, you know, when you, when you figure that out, ask the Lord to strengthen you and to walk with you through that time. I want to finish with one more passage. This is the man that we just talked about. As he wrote a letter to believers that were scattered and he says this, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua and the Messiah. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, also are you to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That came from a man who told the Lord, leave me. You don't know who I am. Just, just, just walk away. And here we see the transformation as he's preaching the gospel and he says to these people, 
You can do it. Yeshua will walk with you. He wants to transform you. You can do it.